Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. One thing that always fascinates me uh, is some of the requirements around the world, some of the laws, some of the rules, odd rules that exist in our world. And, and, and I remember, I think when I was a kid, my grandparents would have like the news on and sometimes they'd have like a segment or something. I'm trying to remember where I saw it, but like random laws and rules would start coming up on the screen. Like, and they would just start coming up. And so I did some research today and I did my best to find rules that are actually true. Now, to be honest, you might, you might fact check me and be like, you're actually wrong. It's like, I apologize. This is what the internet told me was true, okay? And I believe everything I see on the internet, okay? Everything. Wikipedia, it's the best resource in the, on the planet. Um, but in, in, in Italy, in Milan, Italy, it's illegal for citizens to frown in public unless they're at a funeral or visiting someone in the hospital. It's like, yeah, I, I Googled this. I was like, no way, right? Like, there's no way. And the first thing I see is absolutely you're not allowed to do that. I was like, all right. Uh, in in uh, Singapore, it's illegal to chew gum in Singapore because uh, no gum can be bought or sold there. And the law is said to be in place to keep public spaces clean. So no gum is allowed to be chewed. So if you're flying through Singapore on your flight, don't bring gum with you, okay? It's illegal. You might go to jail. In Mexico, it's illegal for bicyclists to lift their feet off the pedals while riding as this might cause them to lose control of the bike. That's a rule I wish we had here in Canada. We should have that rule. Because sometimes people on the bikes, anyway, I don't need to get into it, right? Um, uh, in Georgia, it's illegal for, for you to walk your chicken across the road. So they don't have the, how did the chicken get across the road joke in Georgia? They don't have it. It doesn't exist. They don't get it. It doesn't make sense. It's like, that's because he's going to jail right away, right? In, in uh, Maryland, it's illegal to bring a lion to the movies. Now, I think it's probably illegal here too. But that's like an actual law they have. Like, I think it's pretty straightforward. Don't bring a lion to the, to the theater. Yeah, probably. Because th- trying to get a lion here is probably not easy, I, I would imagine. In this, I love this one. Is in Alaska, it's illegal to push a live moose out of an airplane. Illegal. Not allowed. <laughs> Cannot push a live moose out of an airplane. Now, about to push it out of the plane and the guy's like no I think that's probably illegal and the, the guy, anyway that's the story uh, in, a, in a city in a town in Ontario uh, they had a bylaw that banned whistling or singing in public at any time it's like footloose right not allowed to, to whistle in public or sing which I find so interesting uh, before uh, recently being repealed apparently uh, the Can- Can- Canadian criminal code made it illegal to engage in a duel illegal to engage in a duel and they recently made this legal again, right? What I mean by that is they, it's no longer illegal to engage in a duel. Because obviously dueling was such a common practice back in the day, I guess. Um, and then there's another city in, in Ontario uh, w- with Ottawa that makes it illegal to paint your garage door purple. Yeah. And the reason for that, I guess, is because they want to try and keep this, you know, they don't want your garage door purple. That's why, right? But in our our world, there's some kind of odd requirements or some odd laws. And there's some other odd ones, I'm sure of it. You might even know some that are so odd. But this past Sunday um, at Church From Home, um, if you were to watch it, I shared some of the vision and some of the direction and some of the kind of what I'm feeling for our church for 2024, some of the ideas that God is kind of starting to, 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 to share with me about our church for this new year. And there's this one verse that kept coming to me um, over and over. And it's a verse, maybe you know it, maybe you don't. Um, But this is uh, Micah chapter 6, verse 8. And it says this, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. This verse kept coming to me over and over as I've been praying and thinking about where is God leading us as a church, Micah 6, 8, which is what does the Lord require of you? And it says he's already shown us. And what he's shown us is, is to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly. 
See, this is where I see God is leading us as a church, as a community, as friends, as followers of Jesus this year. I'm very excited to share uh, some of the things that God has placed on my heart for the, for the next few Sundays. You know, we're starting today, kind of an introduction into the book of Micah and kind of what this might mean. And then we're going to go through uh, each of those, act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly over the next three Sundays. And I'm really excited about it. And my prayer and my hope for us as a church is that we can dive in uh, deeper uh, to Jesus this year. Uh, that we can grow closer to him. We can rely on him more. We can trust him more. And we can follow him deeper in faith. And, and I'm really excited about what God is going to speak. And I pray, you know, as he speaks to me, you know, I'm just sharing some of, the, some of the things that are on my heart for our church. Now, before I kind of dive into it, I want to give us some context uh, into the book of Micah. Um, because maybe you've never read it. Maybe you didn't even know it was in the Bible. But this is one of the prophets uh, in the Bible. And so what I want to do, because this, there's a video that, that, that shares so much be better visually and articulately than I ever could about the context of this verse, uh, of this, of this uh, book of the Bible, of this prophet. And it comes from the Bible Project. And if you, you know the Bible Project, they, they do a really good job uh, creating videos ar around scripture and about, um, about some of the books of the Bible and kind of give you context on what it meant in the time and who the writer was and, and all these things. I want to encourage you, um, if you, if you don't know the Bible Project, it's a great resource for you. I want to encourage you to check it out, but we're going to watch just a, a, a few minute video. Um, and I think it'll, again, it'll do a much better job describing the context of this verse and of Micah than I ever could. So let's just watch this a few minute video. Here we go. The book of the prophet Micah. Micah lived in a small town named Moreshet in the southern kingdom of Judah, about the same time as Isaiah. And both the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel had split long ago, and both had been violating their covenant with the God of Israel. So Micah warned that God would bring the big bad empire of Assyria to take out the northern kingdom and come ravage Jerusalem. And he also warned that after them, Babylon would bring an even greater destruction. Like all the prophets, Micah spoke on God's behalf to accuse Israel, or as he puts it in chapter 3, I am filled with strength, with the Spirit of God, with justice and power to declare how Israel has rebelled. And so, most of this book explores Micah's accusations and his warnings of God's judgment on Israel. But Micah also had a message of hope that countered these warnings about the restoration God would bring on the other side of his judgment. And if you dive into the book with us, you'll see how this works. So the first two sections of the book develop Micah's accusations and warnings against Israel and its leaders. So part one opens with the poetic description of God appearing over Israel, just like he did at Mount Sinai. There's fire and smoke and earthquake, but he hasn't come to make a covenant this time. He's come to bring his judgment on Israel for over 500 years of rebellion. Micah goes on to name all of these towns and cities in Israel that are the culprits of all of this rebellion, God's coming for them. But why exactly? So Micah picks a fight with Israel's leaders. He says that they've become wealthy through theft and greed. He alludes to the story of Ahab stealing a family vineyard from Naboth in 1 Kings chapter 21. But also it's because Israel's prophets are corrupt. They're quite happy to offer promises of God's protection to anyone who can afford to pay them. No, Micah says, God has withdrawn his protection from Israel. In the second section of accusations, Micah describes even more how Israel's leaders and prophets have together committed grave injustice. They run the land through bribery, they bend justice to favor the wealthy, and the poor are deprived of their land, their security, and their hope. And all of this is a violation of the laws of the Torah, which declare it illegal to sell land that belongs to families, even if they're poor. And so we find out that God's judgment is going to take the form of an oppressive nation that comes to take out the northern kingdom and Jerusalem and its temple, which will be reduced to ruins. Now these are very stiff warnings, and they're not the final word. Each of these warning sections is concluded with a striking promise of hope. So first is a poem about how God is like a shepherd who's going to rescue and regather his flock, which is the remnant of his people, and he's going to bring them all back to good pasture and become their king once more. 
The second warning section is concluded by picking up this image of the ruined Jerusalem temple. And Micah says this won't be permanent. One day God is going to exalt his temple. He's going to fill it with his presence and fill the city with the remnant of his people. And so God's purpose is to make Israel the meeting place of heaven and earth so that all nations will stream to Jerusalem where God becomes the king of all the nations, bringing peace to the earth. Now, these two concluding poems of hope, they're very powerful. And the next section of the book actually develops them further in a beautifully designed series of poems that are entirely about the future hope of Israel and the nations. So we learn that after the Assyrian attack, Israel will be conquered and exiled to Babylon. But from there, God will restore his people and bring them back to their land. And then we learn that in the new Jerusalem, a new messianic king from the line of David will come. He'll be born in Bethlehem and then rule in Jerusalem over the restored people of God. Finally, in this messianic kingdom of God, the faithful remnant of God's people will become that blessing among the nations. But at the same time, God will bring his final justice and remove evil from his world. The final section of the book returns to this pattern of warning followed by hope that we saw in the first parts of the book. So Micah exposes again the unjust economic practices of Israel's leaders and how it's destroying the land and its people. And here Micah offers his famous words that summarize what it means for Israel to follow their God. He has told you, O human, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This is exactly what Israel has not been doing, and so they will come to ruin. However, the book ends with another powerful note of hope. Israel is personified as an individual who's sitting alone in shame and defeat. It's a clear image of Israel's destruction and exile. And this individual is watching for God's mercy, and he begs God to listen and forgive. But why? Why should God listen to and forgive this faithless and rebellious people? Well, the poet offers two reasons. First, he says, because of God's character. Who is a God like you who forgives sin and pardons rebellion? He knows that God's mercy is more powerful than his anger or his judgment. And the second reason is because of God's promises. He says, you will stay true to Jacob and show covenant love to Abraham as you swore so long ago. Now, these are the final words of the book. They're an allusion to God's covenant promises to Abraham and his family all the way back in the book of Genesis, that all nations would find God's blessing through Abraham's family. But to become a blessing to the nations, Israel must first be faithful to their God. And so this explains this back and forth between judgment and hope in the book of Micah. If God's going to bless the nations through Israel, then he must confront and judge the evil among his people. But his judgment is what leads to hope. Because God's covenant love and promise are more powerful than human evil, and his ultimate purpose is not to destroy, it's to save and redeem. Or as the concluding lines of the book put it, God delights in covenant love, so he will again show compassion. He will trample our evil. He will toss our sins into the depth of the sea. And that's what the book of Micah is all about. Anyway, just better than I could ever do, I think, like of explaining it in like detail and with art. I'm not that artistic, but... Uh, so that's the book of Micah kind of summarized. Uh, I would encourage you um, over the next few weeks to read through it. If you've never read the book of Micah, read through it. It's, an, it's an actually incredible, um, some of the things that kind of come out of it and how powerful it can be. Now, when, when you look at the book of Micah, the context of that, of that, I see some correlation between what was happening then and I think what's happening in our world today. And maybe you can see the same thing. I think it seems that our world is filled with greed and corruption and injustice. It seems like there's so much tragedy happening in our world and a lot of it comes down to the fact that, that, that humanity is greedy and corrupt. I think we've gotten to this place and it's kind of been this way ever since, but there's so much evil in our world. You know, what so many people, so many of us doing what makes us feel good, what makes us happy with little to no regard for the people around them. I don't know if you've noticed this in our culture. We're so, con con we're so focused on ourselves that we forget about other people and what our, how our actions affect other people. 
Because we see Israel here and there's a constant struggle of obeying then falling away. Of walking in justice and then walking in corruption. And walking in generosity then walking in greed. And following God and then walking away. And this is this pattern we see. And not only have we seen it in Israel, I think we've seen it here in North America. We've seen it in, in the North American church. We've, we've seen it here in Canada in our church. That these kind of things kind of try and creep in to the church and to those of us who follow Jesus. It's this tension that not only Israel dealt with, but we deal with today. And how do I know this? Is because I've lived longer than one day on planet Earth. Yesterday, I went to Goodwill. Literally yesterday, I went to Goodwill and I went to go buy some of the things and I found some socks for Socks for Hope and I got them and, and I was so excited. I went to the till and they're like, they, sprint, they, they scan in on my stuff like, hey, you want to donate to Goodwill today? I'm like, absolutely not, I do not. I wouldn't, I, why would I do something like that? That was how my mind went. And, and, and it was just interesting because it's so funny how in one, the same moment of being generous, we can be greedy all at the same time. Of being so focused on so many other things and focusing on Jesus. And maybe it's the same thing. Maybe if you've ever gone to McDonald's, it says, hey, do you want to donate 14 cents to the Ronald McDonald's house today? And I'm like, no, I do not. 14 cents, no chance. My burgers cost way more than they used to. I'm not paying 14 cents. But this is how we are, I think, as, as humans. And, and this verse, the verse Micah 6, 8, comes after the end of what is called uh, the Lord's case against Israel. And so he asked, this, he asked some questions in Micah 6, verse 6 to 7, kind of part of this. He says, what can we bring to the Lord should we bring him burnt offerings? Should we bow before God most high with offerings of yearling calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers uh, of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? And when I read this, I see kind of some hyperbole and some exaggeration in this. Of like, what should we do? Should we bring burnt offerings and young calves or 10,000 rivers of olive oil or 10,000 rams? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children? What is it going to take? It's kind of this context of this. And right after that, we get our verse, which says this, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? I think that maybe what God is saying here in this context is more than any more painful sacrifices, more than any religious practices, more than any generational practices, Israel needs a change of heart. That more than all of that, he said, I think God is saying we need a change of heart. We need to actually change, change who we are from the inside out. It's not about giving more. It's about serving Jesus and loving him and letting him transform our life. I think sometimes we've been in church for so long and what's happened is we've got so caught up in tradition and we've got so caught up in practices that our relationship with Jesus is so poor. Even though we do all the right things, we're doing it for the wrong reasons so our relationship with him is so poor. I think as a nation, as, as followers of Jesus here in Canada, we need a change of heart. We need a change of heart. You see, it's saying here the, in this verse, it's saying the case against you is not very good. You're looking at a life sentence. You're looking at some serious time. But here's the, here's the solution. What does the Lord require? Act justly to love mercy and to walk humbly. I think that's what we need. To love See, 1 Corinthians 13, 3 says this, I get, if I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. I would have gained nothing. Love is what is required. I think love is encapsulated in justice and mercy and humility. I think if we were to approach our families and if we were to approach work and we were able to approach life with justice, mercy, and humanity, I think we'd start to see some big things happen in our city. 
where our focus was so much on how do we love our city and how do we take care of the widows and the orphans? How, how do we do this? I think in order to become more like Jesus, in order to follow him, this is how we need to live our lives, how we need to handle our relationships, how we need to handle strangers on the streets, how we need to handle our kids, handle our families, handle our businesses, handle our friends, handle our churches with justice, mercy, and humility. These characteristics, these traits that I think in some ways have started to become a thing of the past that we need to start to make them a thing of our now and of our future. That when people see the church, when they see you, when they see me, they should see justice. They should see mercy and they should see humility. See, both justice and mercy are so key to God's character. In Psalm 89, verse 14, it says this, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before you. Justice and mercy are so key to God's character. And you know what we love as humans? We love to receive justice and mercy, but it's a lot harder to give it out. We love to receive forgiveness for somebody else when we mess up, but when someone hurts us, it's tough for us to offer the same justice, the same mercy, the same forgiveness that we've received. It's hard. It's a lot easier to receive it sometimes than it is to give forgiveness and mercy and justice and humility. Especially humility in the age of social media. If my kids look cute, you're gonna see it on social media. I posted this photo on my, on my Facebook page of my cover photo for my page. And it's a picture of my family sitting out in our foyer. And we're all so happy. But then you see Jane in the, front, in the, in the picture just like f- seriously frowning. Like, like she's miserable. And I think it's so funny. Because like she wasn't actually upset that day. It's just like just the way she is. But I posted it by because I'm like you need to see my kids do the best, Right? Social media, I think, is dangerous in some capacity because social media is really about how do we promote ourselves? How do we make other people think my life's perfect? Ever get on someone's social media page and you're like, wow, that's the dream. That's the life. And then you talk to them like, wow, yeah, no, you need help. You know, like, (laughs) yeah, you need prayer, (laughs) you know. This is what God has shown us. He's shown us justice and he's shown us mercy. As again, they are foundational to his character. And our response to receiving this justice and mercy is to let that shine before others. To let this shine before others. To mirror his love and to mirror his justice and to mirror his mercy. To be on fire for him, not for tradition, not for practices, not even for the church, but for him. Like why we do this is for him. So we can draw closer to him and we can make him known in our city and in our streets and and, and it's about him. We need to be more like Jesus. See, Jesus said this and it comes the book of Revelation. Revelation 3.15 says, I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you were like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. I think he's trying to say that nicely there, you know. Be hot or cold. The difference between hot and cold and obedience and and disobedience. I think God is trying to bring us back to him since the beginning, since we fell. God is saying, "I, I want my kids back. And I think he looks out and sometimes he sees how the corruption and the greed. And I think his heart breaks. Because sometimes it's the people who shouldn't be acting this way are. And it's, it's heartbreaking sometimes to look out and see it. He wants to bring us back. And how does he do this? He did this by showing us his unconditional love, right? Showing us his justice and showing us his mercy and showing us his humility. By sending Jesus to die on the cross in my place. The punishment I deserved. I didn't deserve justice. I didn't deserve mercy. Yeah, that's exactly what I received. 
And that's the good news, right? So what does God require of us? He requires us to do the same. In a world of corruption, in a world of greed, in a world of hypocrisy, in a world that's so broken, what are we supposed to be? We're supposed to be different. You know what? Our businesses are supposed to be different. Our marriages are supposed to be different. Our kids are supposed to be different. Our homes are supposed to be different. It's supposed to be filled with Jesus. And I'm going to invite Micah up. He's here to play some, some chords. I would do it, but that would be kind of awkward, you know. <laughs> this is, a, you know, this is, again, this has just been so heavy on my heart the past little while. Of what does God require? This big question. And first and foremost, obviously, surrendering our life to him and giving him our life, obviously, but the fruit of that should be justice, mercy, and humility. That's what we should be, people should see when they see us. When they see the church, and they should see love. They should see how much we care about the people around us. And they should see how, how we're willing to forgive one another. And I've, I've heard stories of people who go through horrible things and trauma and, and they struggle and it's hard and I, I know. But then they share their story of how they were able to forgive in the midst of it. That'll make me cry every time. Because I know how painful it is. I know how hard it is when, when your heart is broken. When, when the people you thought would be there that you thought would be there to care for you and take care of you, they disappeared, they ran away, they left, stabbed you in the back, they were gossiping about you. I know how painful it can be. And I think sometimes it's hard for us even to receive the forgiveness ourselves because of how bitter and broken we are on the inside. And if we want to learn how to act justly and we want to learn how to love mercy and we want to learn how to walk humbly, you know what we need to do? Find healing ourselves. Receive this from God. The mercy and the justice and the forgiveness from him. We have to learn how to live this out and how do we learn to live it out? We receive it first. We can't give something we don't have. If you want to learn how to live this way, we got to learn how to receive it from Jesus and receive it because I think God is, is speaking this over this year that we will act justly this year in every aspect of our life. We'll love mercy this year and we'll walk humbly wherever we go. Let's be humble. You know, I'm excited um, I think I've shared to, to go through this verse more over the next three Sundays because there's so much to unpack and you might be like, I don't even know what that means to act justly and to love mercy. Well, we're about to find out, you know. I'm excited to, to go through some of the things and the thoughts that God has placed in my mind. You know, my prayer is that each of us will learn how to live our lives this way to lead others this way, to follow Jesus this way, to lead our kids this way, to have our marriages be this way, and our marriages where we're humble, we're just, and we show each other mercy. I think so many times there's so much brokenness in, in the, the relationships that we thought would be the healthiest, our marriages, end up being some of the most painful things. The spouse we prayed for we got them, but we weren't faithful with it, and it causes a lot of problems sometimes. If we were to learn to be humble, and I see this so much because, and it's so simple, right? Let's just talk about like cleaning in our homes. No one wants to clean their house. And if you do, please come to my house, clean my house. 
I think sometimes some of the biggest like arguments that Beth and I get in is over laundry. Because I despise laundry. I like clean clothes, but I don't like doing the process to get there. And I get it a few, like, you know, 100 years ago, we didn't have washing machines. We, I was the washing machine, you know. But how many times I look at my life and how, how, how so much, I think so much about myself, how much rest I need, how much sleep I'm going to need that night. You know, I'm going to need my, my, my alone time. But I don't even think about what my wife needs. Now, I'm just being honest. Like, this happens weekly where I'm so focused on what I need that I forget what my wife needs too. Let's be humble. Let go of pride. I don't have time for pride. Let's learn to be just in our interactions, to show mercy in our hardships, and to walk humbly Wherever we go, I think our city needs followers of Jesus, us as followers of Jesus, to live this out. To push against corruption and injustice, not with more corruption and more injustice. To push against cruelty. And how do we do? We push against corruption with what? With justice. We push against cruelty with mercy. And we could push against pride with humility. Let's learn to live these things out in our lives. And I think we're going to see transformation in our relationships. I think some of the big, one of the biggest assets we have as humans is our relationships. And we're not very good at taking care of them. So I pray that we can learn to live these things out in our relationships. And our takeaway to this today is this. What is required? Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. And I pray and I hope that as we go through these, that we'll all learn how to live this out in our, in our lives and in our relationships and in our families with our kids. And this is what we need. This is what I need. It's kind of a reminder for me to do this. So let's just pray together. God, I thank you for this moment. 2024, we made it. God, help us as a church. And those of us who call this place home, God, help us live this out. Help us learn to act justly, even when we don't want to. Help us love mercy, even that's not what we want to show. And God, I pray, maybe a dangerous prayer, God, I pray that you humble me this year. Help me be humble this year. God, I just thank you that you're moving in our midst, that you're doing something powerful and mighty this year, 2024. God, I pray for, not just for our church, but the churches across our city. God, I pray that this year will just be filled with more and more of you. God, we love you. Let me give 2024 to you today. In Jesus' name, amen.